Instructions. You will hear a number of different recordings, and you will have to answer questions on what you hear. There will be time for you to read the instructions and questions, and you will have a chance to check your work. All the recordings will be played once only. The test is in four sections. Write all of your answers in the listening question booklet. At the end of the real test, you will be given ten minutes to transfer your answers to an answer sheet. Now turn to section one of your booklet. Section one. You are going to hear a conversation between an agent and a client. First, you have some time to look at questions one to six. Now listen to the tape and answer the questions. Hello. Hi. Good morning. Are you open yet? Yes, we are. Come in. Would you like to rent an apartment in the city? Well, kind of. I'd rather rent one near the harbor if possible. Oh, okay. Do you like the water? Yes, I do. But I actually repair sailboats for a living, so I'd like to be close to work. That's understandable. We all want to live close to work. Well, I think I have something near there. How many rooms would you like? Just one. I'm alone, but I would like to have an extra room for my dog. So you'd like two rooms and an apartment that accepts animals. Hmm. Here's one. It's one block up from the harbor and renting for four hundred and forty-five dollars. How's that? That's perfect. Just what I was hoping to pay. What floor is it on? Floor? Oh, it's on the twelfth floor. That's too high. I'd like to be on the first or second floor so that I don't have to use the elevator. My dog—he's scared of them. Oh well, then that's a little more complicated. Let me make a few calls. Okay, I think I found a couple more for you. Here's one that might suit your needs. How much? Three hundred and ninety-five dollars a month. That's cheap. But it's only a one bedroom, a large one, but it's still just one room. Oh, well, regardless of whether the room is small, I still need a separate room for my dog. What else do you have? Then I have a two bedroom for five hundred and sixty-five dollars on the second floor that is a little further away from the harbor. How far? About a half mile, and they accept pets. That's a little more than I had planned on paying. But I guess I could look at it. What's the address? Two twenty-four Williams Avenue, Harbor Square. Two twenty-four Williams Avenue. Got it. Now look at questions seven to ten. As the talk continues, answer questions seven to ten. What else is included? Let's see. It has a washer and dryer, refrigerator and stove, a bed, dressers and shelves, and access to a swimming pool, game room, and gym. Ooh, I'll definitely take a look. Hi, how did you like it? It's great. I love the amenities, but the bed and furniture are. Awfully dirty. Can they replace those before I move in? Sure, that shouldn't be a problem. Anything else? Yeah, I didn't see anywhere to park my car. Is there a parking lot in the basement? Yes, there is. Would you like to rent a space? No, I'd like that to be included in the rent. Oh well, I'll see what I can do, but I can't guarantee that. 
Do you want to take it anyhow? If those two issues were solved, I would love to take it. This is the end of section one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to Section 2. Section 2. You are going to hear an orientation talk. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 15. Now listen to the tape and answer questions 11 to 15. Welcome to Orientation Week. Today I am here with the captain of our school's women's gymnastics team. Her name is Elizabeth Rain and she is a fourth-year student. I hope you can all see her as an example of a responsible student and athlete, a role model for everyone. Hi Elizabeth. Thank you for stopping by our Orientation Week. Thank you for having me. Welcome to our university, everyone. If there are any of you thinking about joining our school's athletic program, I would strongly encourage you to do it. Being a part of the gymnastics team has been one of my best experiences during my time at this school. It has taught me so much about teamwork and friendship, and has even taught me how to improve my academics by prioritizing my time. I have some questions that I am sure the students will want to know the answers to as well. First of all, how did you find the time to do well in classes as well as train for gymnastics? Prioritizing is the key. You must be very organized. Every day I wake up and I know what I must do for the day. I plan things in order of importance. For example, if today I have a competition for gymnastics in the afternoon, then I know I have to finish my homework and studying in the morning. In other words, keeping an organized schedule of your priorities is very important. Can you explain to the students a little bit about your study habits? Well, I usually try to take classes that I'm interested in. This way, I have no excuse not to study because I chose the classes out of my own preference. I separate my study time by class. For example, if I have five classes for this semester, I will study for one class a day from Monday through Friday and then review for all of them on the weekend. I won't try and study for all five of my classes at one time. It is too hard to do that, to remember everything and not feel like you are going crazy. It is very important to focus the time that you set aside for studying. I do not study with the television on. I try to keep away from all distractions because I find that I learn better that way. But of course, how each individual will study depends on each person. Now look at questions 16 to 20. Now listen to the tape and answer questions 16 to 20. That sounds like good advice. Let's talk a little bit about your gymnastics career. How long have you been doing this sport for and what has been the best moment of your college participation? Well, I've been participating in gymnastics since I was a kid. My parents got me involved in the sport. Hmm, the best moment. I would have to say that there is not one single instance that stands out in my mind as the best moment, but more of a whole experience. My first year in university was definitely one of the best years of my life. 
I met my best friends that year and really learned to grow up and be independent. Our team went to the national championships that year, and it was an incredible experience, so I would count the whole year as my best experience in college. How about the worst moment? It is true, everyone goes through bad experiences. My worst experience would have to be the fall of last year when I broke my wrist. I was unable to participate in sports for the remainder of the year and had to learn how to write with my left hand. I guess when I look back at it, though, even though I wouldn't wish this to happen to anyone, this experience definitely made me stronger as a person. It taught me to look at life with a new perspective and to really value the friends and family that are important and close to me. Thanks for your time, Elizabeth. Do you have anything else you want to tell the new students? Just have a good time. Don't stress out too much, but be responsible for your actions. Work hard and play hard. That's my motto for life. This is the end of Section 2. You now have 30 seconds to check your answers. Now turn to Section 3. Section 3. In this section, you are going to hear a conversation on animal protection. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25. Now listen to the tape and answer the questions. Thanks for joining us today, Mike. How did Baja California become a consideration for a condor release? Our recovery plan for California condors requires us to re-establish the birds in as much as their former range as possible. Baja, being the southernmost recent range for the California condor, works well in that they were only recently lost from the area, mid-1930s and considerable habitat still remains. It is very isolated with very few people in the area. The mountains are spectacular, ranging up to 10,000 feet, or 3,000 meters. Our selected release site is at nearly 8,000 feet, 2,400 meters. Mike, how many birds do you envision flying free in this area, Baja, in the future? We will be releasing four to eight birds on a yearly basis and will reconsider the situation when we have 20 birds in the area. What age do the birds have to be before moving them? That's a good question. Typically we move them at eight months to 18 months old. Birds are ready to fledge, or leave, from the nest at six to seven months of age. In our current release group in Baja, we have birds as old as 30 months. It will be interesting to see how they behave. I expect that they will want to range more than younger birds and make it challenging for us to keep up. Is there a maximum number of birds a certain area can support? Yes, it's called the carrying capacity for any area, for any species. In our case, our strategy to find that number is to saturate the environment to a level where we determine that the birds are showing difficulty either in finding food, behaviorally, or in survivorship. That level is greatly determined by the availability of food in the area and nesting possibilities. Now look at questions 26 to 30.
As the talk continues, answer questions 26 to 30. What do you hope to accomplish with this release in the long run? I expect that well within 10 years the condors will be flying north and joining birds already released in Southern California. Hopefully we will reach at least 150 birds in each of these populations within about 15 years. What would you say is the biggest contribution to the California condor program's success? That would have to be the fact that we were able to breed the birds in captivity from the 27 birds we started with in 1987 to the 205 birds we have today. This is thanks to cooperation between the San Diego Wild Animal Park, the Los Angeles Zoo, and the World Center for Birds of Prey in Bois, Idaho. Are there any problems keeping track of and protecting your released animals outside of the US? Nope. We are using radio transmitters and will be using the new satellite and GPS transmitters as well. Which system is better? Using satellites. The advantages over radio telemetry are numerous. It makes it possible to keep up with the bird's flight without being led miles in a matter of minutes. It took the young condor only a week to migrate across the state, and with just radio telemetry, poor weather can keep a plane grounded, and not all roads are accessible to track them on ground. New technology will allow one to be able to track birds that are not accessible by plane. Also, it is a new way to gauge the effectiveness of reintroduction. How so? If a condor transmitter works properly, researchers will get a location every 10 days for about two years. Do you see an end in sight for the need to breed condors in captivity? Yes, that would be great. But it will take a while for us to establish the two wild populations and make sure that they are sustainable. Part of our recovery is to maintain a captive flock of 150 birds in various zoos around the country as a safety net for the future. This is the end of Section 3. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to Section 4. Section 4. In this section, you are going to hear a lecture on ecology. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 35. Now listen to the tape and answer the questions. Good afternoon. I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Carey, who will talk about the program in restoration ecology. Thanks, Chris. A lot of people think that human beings can do whatever they want to the environment. But as Aldo Leopold taught, land is a system of interdependent parts which should be regarded as a community and not a commodity. Well, that idea has influenced what we teach here in our program, where students come from all over the world to learn about restoring native plant communities back into an ecologically natural state. This field is therefore a combination of formal science with practical applications, and that is quite attractive to many people. We have students, for example, from many different nations who come just to take part in this unique program. Our location is also quite unique. We have the world's oldest restored native plant community in Curtis Prairie at the Wisconsin Arboretum. Some say that this is proof that the science of restoration ecology was birthed in Wisconsin. Well, that may be oversimplified, but our reputation is strong. But students don't have to study prairies only. One student 
Edmund Mukala from the Congo came to study restoring ancient wetlands in the Congo using knowledge gained from historic samples of the soil seed bank. Not all the seeds survived, but some can remain dormant for many years. Mr. Mukala wanted to find out what type of community would be most similar to that ancient seed bank. He has recently returned to the Congo and is now cooperating with the government to implement his findings. Now look at questions 36 to 40. As the talk continues, answer questions 36 to 40. So the only prerequisite for doing research here is that it is a native plant community. That means not just prairies, but wetlands, woodlands, savannas, and other environments. We're proud of the diversity of research topics in our program. And we continue to grow. This year we have 32 new students from 8 different countries. When students first arrive, they begin rigid coursework in statistics, ecology, plant identification, and the theory of landscape change. Then they take part in internships at local conservation agencies such as the Arboretum, the Nature Conservancy, the Parks Department, and others. We find internships to be crucial in helping students apply the knowledge they have gained in the classroom. And we're proud to say that, since the beginning, we have graduated 277 students with master degrees from our programs and 122 students with PhDs. Some have gone on to bigger and better things. One graduate is now the director of the Worldwide Fund for Nature in China. Another is the director of Parks Development in California. And others now lead their own research departments in universities around the world. This is the end of Section 4. You now have 30 seconds to check your answers. That is the end of the listening test. In the IELTS test, you would now have 10 minutes to transfer your answers to the answer sheet.